SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft has a new access tower, Amazon's got a shiny new building at the Cape, and Blue Origin's Jarvis, well, might be a little bit different than we thought. Hi, I'm Matt Anderson for NSF, and I'll be hosting this episode of Flyover along with Max Evans and Ryan Caton. Join us as we check out all that Space Coast news and much more on this Cape Flyover. If you're one of the viewers that loves asking us about towers, you're in luck. There's a new one on the way out there for you. Let's start off with Max, who has the latest coming from SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Thanks, Matt. While Starship activity at Roberts Road has wound down, SpaceX has now finally begun building the crew access tower for Slick 40 at this location. The progress of this construction has been astonishing, with two sections already built and a third undergoing preparations. This is quite a change from our last flyover when only a few parts were laying around and the base stands were not even present yet. It was such an, an early stage of construction that we kind of missed it, but then to be fair, we didn't really expect them to be building these here. But hey, I have no complaints here, or as they say, a surprise for sure, but a welcome one. As you can see, these sections do not look at all like the ones used for Starship, but that's something to be expected given the different use and purpose. These are smaller in footprint, although each section is still quite tall. It seemed like SpaceX conveniently left an 8-foot stepladder next to one of these sections, which helped us make a rough estimate on the height of this segment. Given this, it appears that each segment is about 23 meters tall, or 75 feet for us who use Imperial. This means that SpaceX will likely need about four of these to reach the height of Crew Dragon sitting on top of Falcon 9. We may be able to even guess which section of the tower they're a part of. For example, the segment on the left has hardware to insert another level on top of it, while the other on the right does not. It could be that it's yet to be installed, or it could also mean that the one on the right is the uppermost level of the tower. If that's the case, we could perhaps guess that this floor up here is the one that the astronauts will be reaching up to in order to reach their Crew Dragon spacecraft. It may be likely as well that this square section at the top is related with the elevator shaft to the tower. Another clue that this is the topmost section of the tower is on these structural tubes that are installed on the walls of the tower. You can see the section on the left has much wider tubes like this, while the ones on the right are thinner something one would expect for a section that is closer to the top of the tower. Something interesting to see here as well is that the section on the right is wider than the one on the left. You can see the back side of the section on the right is more or less the same size as the section on the left, but it extends farther down on the front side. This likely means that the crew access tower will be thinner from the bottom and middle sections and then widen at the top. It remains to be seen where SpaceX may build the crew access arm for this tower, but as always, we will keep an eye out for when that happens. Now, I believe Ryan has some updates on Blue Origins facilities and the future of a fully reusable New Glenn rocket. Indeed I do, Max, but before we get to New Glenn's launch pad, let's take a look at Blue Origins campus within the Kennedy Space Center. In this area, most of the action was down at the southern end of the site. We can see that the vertical assembly area has gained a roof since our last flyover and is in the process of gaining walls. These walls seem to be of a similar material to what we see used for tents like at LC-36, Starbase and other locations. Peeking in through the door, we can still see a circular stand of sorts sitting inside of the building. General improvements continue to be made around the Reef Pathfinder building, and the main door is now closed. However, land next to the building appears to be getting prepared for construction. As plans show, this will most likely become another parking area next to what will eventually be a chemical processing facility. Just next door at the large warehouse, there are two jigs being moved around. Two of the large doors were open and allowed us to get a bit of a look inside. There appears to be some more jigs for new Glen tank sections and there may even be a barrel section in view as well. Sat on the other side of the facility is a bunch of large pallets wrapped in white plastic and a lot of rebar on top. It's possible that these are parts for one of the next buildings Blue will be adding to their already extensive facility at the Cape. Moving down to Launch Complex 36, Blue Origin's launch site, we can see that New Glenn's Transporter Erector, or TE, is no longer out on the pad after doing some testing over the last month. As you probably remember, during our last flyover, we saw the TE laying horizontal at the pad, which was raised to the vertical position just a few days later. It stayed out on the launch pad for a few weeks before returning to the hangar. Looking at the launch pad, there appears to be a large hose running into the launch mount. This could possibly be an air hose, which leads us to believe there could be work ongoing inside of the mount. 
outside of the new Glen hangar, we can see the upper stage simulator sitting on cradles. As a reminder, we saw this simulator being used to test a mini TE for a New Glen upper stage at the launch pad. It's possible that Blue will be using this rig to test New Glen upper stages on the main pad prior to integration and launch. At the far side of the complex, the Jarvis slash Clipper tank still sits on its test stand. Speaking of this tank, Blue Origin recently filed a patent application for a design of a fully reusable upper stage, just like what this tank is supposed to be testing. The design described in this patent shows a 7 meter wide upper stage with an aerospike engine at the base which also features an actively cooled heat shield. According to the document, this would be made up of two BE3U power packs and consist of up to 30 combustion chambers. Alicia spoke about this new design patent in detail during the last episode of This Week in Spaceflight. This design and thrust kind of resembles the upper stage of New Glen. However, this could be an old study and Blue Origin may not be going forward with it at all. This patent application was started almost two years ago and since then the company may have changed its mind. This design is also reminiscent of Stoke Space's reusable upper stage concept, although there are some subtle changes and, obviously, this is a far larger rocket. It is important to note, however, that the Jarvis program was first made public around the time of this patent being filed, so it may well have some lessons learned from this study. What do you think? Will Blue Origin try that method or maybe something completely different? Checking in at the shuttle landing facility, sorry, the launcher landing facility, there was a long awaited announcement about the customer for the payload processing facility being constructed on the site of the mysterious Project Comet. Space Florida announced that the facility will be operated by Amazon to prepare and integrate their Kuiper Internet Constellation satellites with ULA's Vulcan and Blue Origin's New Glenn rockets. Amazon invested approximately 120 million US dollars into the construction and high value equipment. The construction of outfitting the 100,000 square foot facility is expected to be completed in late 2024 before it comes online in 2025. As we can see from our flyover, work actively continues on the structure which has roughly doubled in size since we last saw it. Also mentioned in the press release was the 1.3 mile segment of the utility corridor which is currently under construction. The corridor is expected to be completed in 2024 and will be a vital part of future growth at the launch and landing facility. While other launch pads at the Cape still sit dormant like ULA's Slick 41 or Relativity Slick 16, SpaceX's launch pads have been quite active since the last flyover, but for that, let's hand it back over to Max. At SpaceX's Launch Complex 39A, not a lot of visible change was evident from our last flyover, but within its HIF or Horizontal Integration Facility, a beast has been growing and being prepped for rollout. SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket has been assembled inside for the past few weeks in preparation for the Echo Star 24 mission. Since our last flyover, the SpaceX schedule though has changed quite a bit. Back then we still expected to see a Falcon Heavy fly from here, but instead carrying the classified USSF-52 mission. However, that mission has been delayed until at least October now. It is now understood that the side boosters on this Falcon Heavy are landing back on landing zone 1 and landing zone 2 here at the Cape instead of on two drone ships. That's a pretty significant change of plans if you ask me, but I'm not going to complain because that means I get to shoot another double booster landing. How considerate. Thanks SpaceX. The Falcon Heavy Transporter Erector, or TE, was moved inside the hangar the day we flew, and in fact, it may already be on the pad with the rocket by the time you watch this video. So make sure to hop on Space Coast Live and see if that's true or not. You can let us know in the comments section down below. Over at Space Launch Complex 40, we can see that the TE there was missing as well as it was inside the hangar to prepare for the Starlink Group 66 mission. Here we can also see some more progress on the crew access tower that we mentioned before. While the sections are being built at Roberts Road, the main foundations are being finalized here. You can see a new small building has popped up and will likely be next to the base of the rocket. This could be some sort of support building for the pad crews and may include restrooms for the crew. I know if I were them, I would prefer not to use what they call the maximum absorbency garments of their suit. Two hours waiting on Crew Dragon can feel like an absolute eternity when nature calls. Although one day, I'm aiming to find out. Probably anyone here will tell you that they're not on team maximum absorbency garment, but ask yourself this. When the weather hits, how does the NSF hosting crew get through those long live streams? Jokes aside, you can see that this week the Cape is bustling as always. Blue Origin seems quiet, but don't let that fool you. A lot of progress is ongoing on its new Glen rocket. And new companies like Amazon are coming into town and providing jobs and money and maybe their own maximum absorbency garments to the area. And hopefully in the future, their broadband satellite project will help bring internet access to more people across the globe. 
Meanwhile, SpaceX is now preparing its second crew-capable launch pad while launching at an ever-increasing rate. Let us know what you think about all that in the comments. Now, I don't know about you, but things are getting only more and more exciting each week here, and if you appreciate the work that we do at NSF, consider subscribing, liking this video, and clicking the bell so you can be notified when we go live or publish another video. We're supported by viewers like you, and we would love for you to join them. Now that is all for this week. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.